All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to move this down a little bit. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple things today. Uh, the kind of the two key takeaways, I'm just going to lay these out now and then kind of get there, is I want to talk about the idea of dealing with data of this scale, of this volume, and how we can kind of make it consumable for smaller groups. I'm going to talk about archives of convenience. And then I'm going to talk about kind of using AWS infrastructure to get there and how it enables a whole other class of participants that really weren't able to take advantage of this kind of data at scale. So with that, kind of setting some context. Um, we sincerely believe that organizations that can leverage data are going to devour ones that can't. Uh, you've probably heard the expression that Netflix is a metrics platform that just happens to serve video. There's a tremendous truth to that. And we're generating data at an unprecedented rate. And the tools and capabilities to handle that and deal with that have to grow with it, have to be able to scale. So as part of that, there are billions of dollars worth of publicly funded data sitting there waited to be, to be used. Right? Data is a national asset. And right now, too much of that is locked up. It's in formats that are kind of archival friendly, but not readily usable. They're in massive, massive sizes. It requires assets. It requires a skill set to get at it. And it's one of those things that it's just not working right now. An estimate is that Earth scientists spend about 60% of their time getting at that data and trying to prepare that data. So to put that in context, like to make that a little bit more real, this is a 50 minute talk. I would spend the next 30 minutes up here playing with my laptop, getting these slides ready to then talk to you for 20. It's absolutely unacceptable in pretty much any industry except here. And data wrangling is like a whole career path that you can go down. And it's just, if you can go at this, if we could have this, like not even make a big success, they're still spending a third of their day doing it, but if we could have this, you could double the amount of science, you could double the amount of research that's going on to get there. So this kind of throws this out there as the problem, but it's getting compounded. So one of the things that we do is we support NASA in some of their cloud transitions. And part of what we're looking at now are some of the upcoming missions. They have some new missions coming up, SWAT and NISAR. They're going to be generating data at just an insane rate. NASA is looking to move hundreds of petabytes to data, of data to the cloud, up to AWS, in the near future. NISAR, one of the new missions coming up, they're 300 gigabyte granules. So this data is carved up into pieces, accessible pieces, at 300 gigs each. There's going to be 150 petabytes of data put up there, 80 terabytes a day, new data being generated. Right? This is just an insane amount of data, but this stuff is used for things like volcanoes, floods, um, uh, forest monitoring. Like, there's tons of incredibly important uses for this information, but it's not, it, it's just very difficult to get to, which sets up this kind of weird situation. If you have the resources, you can figure out how to harness big data. But what happens if you don't? What happens if you're not the group that either has the resources, whether that's dollars, people, skills, time, pick your problem, what do you do? How do you avoid kind of that situation where you get consumed by other groups? So for all the work we've done, and this is a little, honestly a little painful for me, but of all the work we've done in trying to push data out there, we still hear from big name people, I don't know what data exists. I can't use it, even if it is out there. I don't know how to get it, or I can't find it. Like I know this thing exists, but I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to find it. I don't know what to do with it. So if you step back and we think about how we approach problems, we approach them kind of threefold. We want to better understand the problem we're going after through data. We want to be able to bring the data that's relevant to the problem and understand what's really going on and make factually based decisions. We want to build solutions around that and actually be able to affect that problem. And then we need to measure how we did with analytics. Well, that leaves us in a bad spot because now what we have are we have clients that we're working with that we sincerely care about their mission. They're really trying to make a major impact. We know that there's billions of dollars worth of data. There's hundreds of petabytes of data sitting out there waiting to be consumed. How do we bridge this gap? So we decided to, to take a, a piece of it here. So we set out a couple of goals. Um, we want to make the data discovery easier and interactive. And we wanted to target kind of lower bandwidth, lower resolution, lower processing devices. We want to try to make this stuff as accessible and discoverable as possible. We needed to be highly configurable. So both in terms of the data that we're using as well as the processing that we're actually going to be applying to it. Um, <laughs> we're a small company, we're not NASA, and so we really had to look at the budget and how do we do this in a cost-effective way. 
And this is where kind of the AWS managed services pieces come into it, in particular serverless computing. We need to be able to scale as close to zero as possible when it's not actively doing something. But then when we actually, when we want to scale this up to really work with clients who are literally trying to save the world in some manner, how do we do it? How do we scale up? And it set up kind of this little bit of a philosophical one at the bottom, of stop putting data in things. There's a lot of efforts in terms of, okay, I'm gonna take this source data, I'm gonna reprocess it in some way, I'm gonna jam it into my analytics tool. Okay, but it only goes at kind of a part of the problem. If that tool or if that application is not consuming all of the data that you might wanna use, well now you just have another place to go look, another archive that you need to deal with and figure out how to effectively extract data out of or merge data into. Um, you haven't really solved the problem. So the asterisk on the things is because you should put it in the cloud, but uh, don't put it in a box when we get up there. All right, so this is kind of what we set out. So we had this idea of kind of being this personal shopper for data. So um, you know, if, if I'm using something like Trunk Club, uh, I tell them kind of who I wish I was, and uh, they go and they, somebody who dresses better than I do shops and puts together a thing, sends me some outfits, and I can kind of go from there. So that's kind of the philosophy behind this. I want to study a hurricane. I want to study a volcano and be able to pull together kind of heterogeneous, interdisciplinary, curated data together into these things and give me a data set that I can work with. Now, if you're the kind of user who knows I need Motto 2 1KM data, like it's probably not targeting you. You're, you're, you know, if you're on the instrument team, this is not your thing. We're trying to go after how do we make this data more accessible and more readily available. So at a high level, what we talked about is something like this, kind of an overall data flow. There is some data in the cloud now, public data sets, NASA, NOAA, USGS. Um, I learned today that apparently there's a Marvel Universe interrelated data set up there too. But um, there's a lot of data available in the cloud now, but it's kind of distributed depending on who put it up there and how it's up there. There's also a ton of data that still exists on-prem. And even with efforts to do this transition, those products are not gonna show up tomorrow. This is gonna take some time to move these. Um, there's data exposed through OpenDAP. There's data exposed through the OGC WXS services. There's lots of capabilities to expose this data, FTP even still. But how do we make that and kind of bring those things together? And so we had this idea of, okay, we're gonna go after some discovery pieces, and then we're gonna be able to create, kind of on the right-hand side here, this idea of an archive of convenience. So when people talk about the cloud, you always hear a lot of talk about kind of the elasticity of computing, right? We can do an elastic, we can scale up and down from a compute perspective. What we wanted to take advantage of is kind of the elasticity of storage. We can create basically ephemeral archives that contain the data you want in the way you want to use it, and you can then process that or combine that with other things, whatever you want to do with it, and then when you're done, we can destroy that and clean that back up. Um, and then layering on top of this kind of integration with other points, and I'll talk about that as we go. All right, so here's what we put together. Um, this is a demo piece. Um, I'm using Go's data for this. This is Go 16 data, uh, honestly, because it's just beautiful data. Uh, but everything I'm talking about applies to other products. So the idea here is you can come and hit this tool. Um, you can see Go's. This is the entire Go's archive. Um, this renders, uh, I'll show you some more when we I flip over to the tool. Um, this is the entire archive. Uh, it updates daily. So as new data is ingested, we can trigger it and, re and, uh, and continue to extend the video. Um, but everything is scrubbable. We can move through this, we can select events, and again, I'll, I'll show you some more of the features here. From here, though, once you've selected your event, you can ask to stage some data in S3. So what we're showing here are bands within Go's, uh, but again, think about this across multiple products. So I want to be, a, I want some Landsat data, I want some Sentinel data, I want some Go's data, I want it in this area of interest, I want in this time of interest, and I want you to stage it for me in this output format. I'm showing czar there. There's a couple other things I'll talk about when we get a little deeper. Um, and then an email address because it's the internet. So what happens here is this thing will run and it's gonna produce an S3 bucket for you. In that S3 bucket, we're gonna put out the clip of the actual area you were looking for. Because again, we're trying to figure out, we're trying to make this data accessible. So if what you want is just a pretty screenshot of Maria or pretty video of Maria to embed, we can give you that. We can clip it and drop it in there. If, uh, if what you want are images, high resolution images, PNGs, we spit those out in there as well. And then ultimately we give you a data archive that you can attach a, a more sophisticated analysis tool or use that to feed something like Redshift, um, a uh, Hadoop cluster, whatever the case may be, to kind of do the analysis you want to do. We can plug into these things. What we set out to do is not try to solve the general case. 
um, you know, hundreds of petabytes, thousands, tens of thousands of products out there. Instead, we're prioritizing the ones that are of interest to people. Which ones need, are gonna have the broadest user base? What tools do we need to be able to feed this into and kind of stop trying to solve this overall general case of it? Once we've got that data there, now users can take it and kind of extend it out wherever they wanna go. This is a Jupyter notebook. I'll show you some more of this in a minute, but this is kind of a Jupyter notebook plugged into that S3 bucket. We're not feeding this into a custom and analytics tool. We're not feeding this into something proprietary. We're, making, we're staging this data from whatever source we need to get it from, applying whatever processing we need to do to, to make it usable, and then sticking, making it available in S3 or plugged into your tool of choice as long as we support it. And I'll talk about Pangeo in a minute. All right, so behind the scenes, kind of how this stuff works. What we have is we had to go after the discovery problem first. We had to figure out, all right, how do we make this approachable? Um, there are plenty of tools out there that let you search a specific archive. How do we go at kind of making this look like something you can get to? One of the things that we've done um, kind, of, kind of unrelated or kind of tangentially to the earth science space is we spent a lot of time doing video streaming processing as well. Right now, it's something like 70 some odd percent of internet traffic is streaming video. Um, if you're streaming a 4K uh, movie, these things are huge, right? So a single scene in Goes is 5,400 by 5,400, right? Like they're, they're big tiles. But streaming 4K video isn't that far off. And when you break down kind of how streaming video works, you have this video and it's made up of these individual frames, right? Lots of frames are together there. Those are run through a codec that's designed to produce uh, high compression across transition between frames. So now you produce this, this streaming video capable thing. But this is still a relatively large file. All right, so how do we kind of break that down? So that gets fed into, this is again a solved problem in the video space. That gets broken down using something like HLS, HTTP live streaming, uh, Dash is another one. And what they do is they take this, high, this uh, relatively high resolution video, generate a manifest file for it, split it up into very small chunks, two second segments, something along those lines. And what this lets you do is now fetch, prefetch based on bandwidth, how much you need to be able to stream, to show what you're showing, but also lets you arbitrarily jump into the archive. So we took advantage of that and we crawled the entire Go16 archive and produced multiple resolution videos off of it. I'll talk some more about that later. So it's not, it doesn't just work for Go's though, right? And again, I'm, I used Go's because it's really pretty. This is Himawari data showing the eclipse. Um, next time it passes over, uh, you'll be able to see the sun pass over and the eclipse kind of chase it in the other direction. Um, this is Himawari data. Uh, this is uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory data. Again, assembling, same concept. We're applying kind of video codec, video technologies. I gave a talk uh, several years ago at AGU um, where it, it really bothered me that there were tools like Final Cut Pro and video editing software that can do histograms, that can do live filters and, and applications against video streams at 4K resolution on you know, your iPad and moving around a set of data in the science space that are like, okay, they're 5K by 5K, not 4K, but still this was kind of this insurmountable problem and it really bothered me. And so we applied a lot of the video technologies to it. This is Rosetta data uh, from ESA. Um, and in this case, what you're seeing is kind of the, you know, the, the uh, asteroid orbiting or rotating, but uh, same concept being applied here. All right, so how this works under the covers, how we make this happen. Uh, NOAA data is available, the GOA data, GO 16 data is available in uh, the public data set. Uh, so there's an S3 bucket, there's an event that's triggered whenever new data is added to it. We hang on for that. It's one of those kind of embarrassingly parallel problems, but we use Lambda to then take those individual scenes and produce PNGs. So we can scale that out kind of at whatever level, however fast we want to go through the archive, we can kind of scale that horizontally. It's really budget driven, not anything else. Um, these PNGs are then put together and we can leverage the Elastic Transcoder service to start reassembling these. So we take these PNGs, we spin up a cluster that converts those into small H.264 videos, again, using that video encoding, and then feed this all into the Elastic Transcoder, a managed service, which then reassembles this up into a video, carves it back into the tiny uh, two-second chunks that lets us do the streaming and kind of the arbitrary seeking into the data, and dumps that into an S3 bucket. All right, 
So now we have a video. The first time we did this with Goes, I think it ran for somewhere around 48 hours, uh, 48, 50 hours to do the entire 20 some terabyte Goes archive. Uh, once we, we felt reasonably comfortable that this worked, we turned the volume up and it took a little over two hours to kind of reprocess the entire archive when we were making tweaks to how we were doing the frame generation and everything else. All right, so we have a video stuffed in S3. So now we look at, okay, how do we get at this? Again, low cost, simple. We put together a little static site hosted on S3 with, with CloudFront. Runs completely client side, there's no server backend for this. Uh, this is available to distributed there. It's serving up that HLS video stream with two second chunks, and then wrote some JavaScript to be able to translate from a time sequence in the video frame back to the underlying science frames. This lets us map back into the actual uh, underlying GOES data. All right, so some idea of the numbers. The GOES 16 full disk archive was 20 terabytes. Uh, at 640p, it's about 540 megs for that video, all the way out to kind of the other end at, at 3K, 4K-ish, uh, depending on how you define that. It's about 12 gigs. One of the features of HLS video streaming and Dash as well is that you can make these available and based on bandwidth usage, it'll automatically fall to different resolutions. And so we can move through and kind of get that user experience the way we wanted it. Um, we're doing it with HLS. Again, you can, you can do all this with Dash um, all through the managed service. All right, so then we move to the staging piece. So now we have an application, we can find some data of interest, we can pick an event, we can mark it, and now we gotta make this data available for users. So when you click that staging button, we actually create two buckets. We create a public access bucket, and in there we drop the index.html file, we drop a copy of the video. Again, we use the Elastic Transcoder service to slice out that little clip and make it available. We drop in a metadata file, we can drop in a Jupyter Notebook, and I'll show you an example of one. And then we create a second bucket, and this is the in-region access bucket. This is where the actual data goes. This is the raw stuff. I get thumbnails are also in the, the public one. The, um, the in-region one is where the real data goes. This is gonna be terabytes of data, potentially, depending on what you've selected. The reason we do in-region access is, again, from a cost perspective, uh, we don't wanna be in a position where we're creating a bucket and then somebody's egressing it back out. So we're paying for storage, but we don't wanna pay for like, somebody puts up a link to this and now we're paying for distribution. So we spin up a separate bucket, we put access controls on it so that you can do in-region access, which is free, there's no cost for data movement there, but you can get to it and do whatever you want. And ultimately, if you wanna serve it out, that's your prerogative, but it's not something that we're gonna deal with. So the way this works is similar. Um, you click the button, we use AWS step functions to orchestrate this, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, but this is another one of those kind of embarrassingly parallel problems. We have these underlying frames, we have this underlying data, and ultimately we need to do some processing on it, and we can do it in, in parallel. So what we have is a step function that walks through this. As soon as the step function kicks off, it forks. First thing we do is we generate the bit video clip. That's done in parallel, it's done through uh, Elastic Transcoder service, dropped in the bucket. Once some content exists in that bucket, the web page is visible, we can start providing you some basic information, and in the background, what we'll do is then start divvying up this processing as much as we kinda wanna scale it horizontally. So we'll start partitioning the key space. If you're gonna pull in 1,000 frames, 10,000 frames, we'll divide those up into chunks and then farm that out using batch across a spot instance, or across a cluster of spot instances. Um, this is another one of those kind of scalable as people are willing to pay for. Um, the more we can blow it out horizontally, we can do, in theory, you could go all the way to a frame per instance if you wanted to. Uh, the cost would be crazy, but you could do it. Uh, once this happens, the data gets pushed into a common archive, we can clean up the data, and we can send out a notification email. All right, a little tangent, so why czar um, for our output format? One is, uh, we aren't trying to play favorites here. There are other options. The source data for Goes is in NetCDF, so if you want tiled access to NetCDF, you can use it, it's there. Um, what Zar gets us is kind of this open format for n-dimensional arrays and chunking in n-dimensions, so we can chunk accordingly. It's, I, I'm not saying Zar is necessarily the right solution, it is a solution, and it's one we're using one of the big uh, pluses it gets us is it's fully parallelized read and write. So again, that horizontal scalability, we can begin dumping data into this concurrently across as much as we want to scale out. Um, there's also no infrastructure pieces sitting in front of this. There's no kind of machines we have to route this data through or APIs kind of a, that from that perspective, we can write directly to it using the libraries. And then it's compatible with Pangeo. Um, if you've never used Pangeo, Pangeo is kind of an open source stack for kind of for earth science data analytics and data processing. Um, 
I have an asterisk there because it's kind of compatible with Pangeo. Right now, Pangeo has a limitation that it can only read uh, ZAR files created by X-Array, its own, uh, kind of the, the Python, if you're familiar with it, Python X-Array. It can only read array, uh, data that it had written. Um, so we actually have to treat that as kind of a separate format. We can either output it in a format that's supportable by Pangeo, or we can output it in a format that's, that we can use. Within that archive, now what you have is this uh, this is our file, this archive of the data you wanted. We've organized it by groups. We have it by bands within those groups. Each data set's represented, and it can be heterogeneous if we wanted it to. We can embed metadata. We can embed information about the bands, the wavelengths, and everything else. All of that's in there as attributes within the data, and you can start to hit it with your own tool. So I'm going to switch over here and just give you kind of a, a sense that I'm not making this up. So here's, refresh this. Um, so here's uh, hitting this thing live right now, um, this is streaming the Go's archive. You can see down at the bottom kind of the prefetching that's happening on the little uh, progress bar. Um, I can arbitrarily jump to some location or some time in the archive, um, and now we're there. Down at the bottom, we have a date time stamp. Again, that's being reversed out of kind of the time position, the seek position within that data. Right now, we're using the NOAA hurricane feed, but there's other ones we can pull from uh, to get some basic information, so I can hit Maria, and what'll happen is this is going to fetch the Maria start and end information, and then jump to that time loop, and just loop that from kind of the beginning of Hurricane Maria to the end. And so you can kind of see Hurricane Maria making its way over Puerto Rico there, and it'll, it'll, uh, that full animation is there. We can tweak that, we can tune that if we wanted to, but what I'll do is I'm gonna go ahead and hit stage. So with staging it now, I can go ahead and pick the bands that I'm interested in. I can do multiple bands. Again, ideally what we'd have here is multiple products. I'm only showing goes, um, but we can do like a little level water vapor. Uh, our output format, either czar or x-ray czar. And then, let's go ahead and put this in here. And stage that. That's gonna kick off that background process that I mentioned to start putting that together. It gives me a URL of where my data is gonna be available. This is that public bucket. This is that first S3 bucket, we've spun that up. If I hit that, right now it's just staging data. It's a placeholder thing until that bucket gets put together and the video clips in there. Uh, I'm gonna refresh this and hopefully it will be fast enough that I can show you this. Whoops, not that one. I'll come back, there we go, all right. So uh, in here, this is the, uh, basically your archive that we've just created. This is that archive of convenience. There's the video loop uh, that it's been subset out of the overall Go's archive. And again, this is Go's data. We can apply this to whatever it is you're looking at. Um, we have the bands you selected, the output format, some basic information, the links to it. We have the actual czar S3 bucket information that we've made available. So I'm gonna switch over to here. So this is an example uh, Jupyter Notebook dropped in, all right? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna come down and hit run through this. And so what we can do is look at this archive. This is a small archive here. I've only put one day's worth of data in it, but we can go through and we can say, okay, what information is available in this archive, right? Again, we stage this data. This is a subset of the overall information. Uh, Zar gives us the ability to kind of represent it like this. But what you're seeing here are, are the individual bands. 5K, 5424 by 5424, they're 16-bit integers. That data has now been staged and is ready to be, is, is accessible. We can pull out some metadata information out of this and all the way down to things like what's the wavelength. From here, now we're just interacting with the data in kind of the way that we want to interact with that data. We can take it and we can render different bands. It's water vapor, I'm gonna go ahead and do this one. Right, this is using a different uh, band path or a different uh, color spectrum that we're using to render this. I'm doing this in Jupyter Notebooks, but you could do this in kind of whatever it is your, your tool of choice would be. Um, I'm doing this against a local czar archive. I wasn't sure of network connectivity, but the whole thing is the same, hitting the actual S3 bucket uh, just by pointing to a different S3 root. Um, and then lastly, if I take a, an X-Array compatible one, you can see the, just the extent of metadata that was pulled out of the original GOES data that's embedded in there and is available. So this is where you could take this archive, plug it right into something like Pangeo, leverage Dask, and now you can do kind of parallel execution, parallel computation against this as you go forward. All right.
so as we put this together, we learned a lot. Um, there are some serious bottlenecks with this approach. This is a breakdown of kind of the time we spent doing this. Um, or not the time we spent doing it, the time it spends processing. So the biggest hunk of this time is spent moving data around. This is a real issue. Um, data movement within AWS is the biggest chunk of time spent in here. 30% to kind of read off of the original data, and then about 55% of the time was then restaging that into an S3 bucket on the way out. Only about 15% of our time was actually spent doing processing. Um, this is for the archive generation, not for the video generation. Um, the kind of related to this is this idea of auto-scaling our batch processing. Um, the idea would be that we have this batch processing capability as people kick off jobs, as they spin these things up, it scales out horizontally, and we can start doing some of that processing under there. Um, the, the spot instance, that cluster spin up time is really, really painful. And so we ended up having to switch to a basically a minimum sized auto scaling group that we can kind of adjust the volume on a little bit uh, to kind of deal with roughly how long we want this to execute. Lots of different options we could take here. There's chunk sizing and compression that you can tune within as our archive. We can take advantage of those capabilities depending on your format. We can actually avoid this entirely and feed it into something like a Kinesis stream, depending on what you want to do. But there's lots of optimization opportunities in there. And then this idea of kind of local caching of hot files, this idea of hitting local data. And then ultimately smarter archive creation which gets there. But really, this is a question of kind of, okay, this slide, I, I don't mean to put up a lot of bullet points, but this one was just kind of like, oh, we could do this, and we could do this, and we could do this. The philosophical idea here is stop trying to solve kind of the general availability of the data. Like, okay, we're gonna put it in COGS, cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs, and then all of a sudden everything's magical. It really needs to be, there's so many valid use cases, whether you're doing machine learning or whether you're doing uh, statistical analysis or whether you're doing time series over long archives. There are a variety of needs all that vary and how you wanna get at that data varies. And so fundamentally what we wanna do is go at that elasticity of storage and be able to spin this up and compute it and dump it out there. And so what we wanna start doing is looking at, okay, additional products and providing data bundles. We wanna look at additional output formats and what else we can use, uh, what else is useful for the community and put out there. Um, optimizing the, the actual build time. So local caching, horizontal scaling, um, czar tuning, time-lapse video generation. Um, if you wanted to do a time series analysis, we could show you the loop over Maria, but if you're looking at something longer, if you're looking at land change or land use information, we may have to show this over years. We have access to that data, that's no problem, but we need to be able to render things that actually help make that understandable and comprehensible. Um, additional bands for video scrubbing. So I'm scrubbing through false color uh, so you can see what that imagery looks like, but let's scrub through something else. Let's look at scrub through far, uh, fire anomalies um, or let's scrub through uh, water vapor. Um, but to be able to give me the idea of like, let me see the data, I wanna see it, let me see the loops associated with it. Once we move into the video space and kind of the ability to do that, well now we can start looking at GPU-based video filters. Um, we can start taking advantage of kind of all of the technology space associated with 4K video processing, and let's start applying those. In the frame generation, we can expand that out with kind of Python modules that you can drop in there, or Python code that you can drop in there to be able to do compute on frame generation. So you've got your source video, you're looking to transfer it into an archive of convenience, let me, not, let me do more than just kind of transformation, let me do reprojection, let me do some basic analysis. Um, you could potentially do model training, machine learning model training off of this, but I think you'd almost wanna go the other way where you could actually do model execution. Let me take these individual frames as I'm producing them into the archive and I'm gonna run it through for object detection um, or whatever I've trained my model on. Once you get to that point, now we can start talking about things like overlays and annotations. I know where the hurricane is. I know the hurricane path. Let me annotate that. Let me overlay that. Let me overlay that with additional information. Let me do object detection and generate an overlay image that I can now do compositing when I play that back or when I want to look at that. Again, it depends on your use case, but there are just a ton of opportunities once you kind of take this idea of there's something between I've dumped petabytes of data in the cloud and I'm an end user trying to figure out deforestation. Like there's this whole chunk that we tend to skip over as a community of like how do I map, how do I connect those two? There's a huge gap there. And so what we're trying to do is get at that. Subframe rendering, so this is kind of pulling out small pieces instead of doing 5K pieces. Um, common projections for heterogeneous products. Let me pick products. I don't know how to get these two together. Let me take a data recipe that's blessed by NASA. This is the right way to reproject this data. I'm gonna, we can provide that implementation and be able to do those reprojections so these two products are usable together. 
So kind of in summary here, um, we leveraged AWS and the spot market, ECS, Elastic Transcoder Service, to take what was 20 terabytes of data and make this visible and scrubbable and accessible uh, from an iPad, an iPhone, all the way up to a machine, to a, you know, your full machine, um, into by several orders of magnitude, reducing that overall data set. You're not doing science against the video necessarily, but you're able to get at the data that way. And depending on your use case, that might be all that you need. This works across lots of different products. Um, AWS in batch parallelizes this. It makes it, um, again, kind of almost embarrassingly parallel to get there and scalable. Uh, and then what we get is this kind of highly elastic access to the data targeted at use cases. Uh, we have triggers set up on these buckets to clean them up after a week. It's all obviously tunable. But again, this is all kind of leveraging that elasticity of storage. And then ultimately, other than the actual data that we have sitting in a bucket, this all goes back to zero when nobody's using it. So kind of from a call for participation or a call from help perspective, um, I sincerely want to hear from people. Uh, <laughs> If it's, if it's not nice, then wait till after the question session. But um, I do sincerely want to hear feedback of, you know, do you have data that you want to make available? What formats do you make it available in now? What formats would you like it to be in? Um, what information out of that data do you want to know? How do you find it? How do you subset it? What other ways can we potentially make some of this uh, available to you? Um, and then if you're in the science community, help us not break this data. Uh, you know, Algorithms that are established, blessed, re um, peer-reviewed, um, anything in that space, that would be fantastic. Again, we don't want to do anything that kind of disturbs the underlying data. Um, but really, feedback here, this is, uh, this is you know, kind of putting out there, here's the concept. Um, we've got a while before we have this kind of utopia of all the data sitting there for everybody to use in exactly the format you want. And so this is something to bridge that gap between where we are now and getting this data out to people who do not have the infrastructure or the capabilities to put it together. So I think this is just a beautiful video, so I put it in twice. Um, and then with that, I will open it up for questions. Oh, uh, this is out there, this is live. Um, uh, it is absolutely, uh, the version that's out there is just exposing Go's data. The bucket will be deleted um, after a short period of time, five days, I think, is what we set it to. Um, the bucket will be cleaned up. Uh, egress should be blocked off, uh, but please be gentle. Um, but uh, this link is available. And with that, I will take any questions. Yeah, so the, the chunking, so the two second, the question, I'm sorry, repeat the question, is um, if two seconds is the wrong chunk size, how do we uh, regenerate or rechunk that data? So uh, the chunking size there at the two second chunk piece is, um, is on the video generation. Um, and so that's actually generated off of the master video, which is in the gigabytes range, megs to gigs, uh, after we've done the original video assembly and the vid video encoding. Um, generally, from a streaming perspective, two seconds is about right. It's small enough that you can jump kind of anywhere, but large enough that uh, usually on a even reasonable bandwidth at a low resolution, you can keep up with playback. Um, the, the trickier chunking is in the archive generation. Um, we we're actually talking about this, this morning at a round table. Um, we talk a lot about cloud-optimized geotiffs and the idea that they provide tiling within data. Um, if your area of interest is sufficiently large, you're gonna need not just the entire cog, the cloud-optimized geotiff, you might need multiple ones, which means that internal chunking of those cogs really doesn't get you anything, right? There's just kind of this arbitrary chunking that's done inside of the cog. If you need multiple, say, Landsat tiles, right, these, you have to stitch these things together, you don't get any advantage of that. The flip is true, too, if you need a really small area and your tile size is large, well, the chunking may not actually help you all that much because you're, you're so far down inside of that. So this processing step, again, that intermediate step going at how do we get at your use case, gives us the ability to tune that based on potentially the area of interest and the data resolution that you're using. So if you're using a, um, a 250 meter um, uh, scene, then, and you're looking at a very tiny place, well, we can partition appropriately. If you're using, if you have very high resolution data, you're using centimeter resolution data and you're looking at a city, we could potentially collapse these into bigger chunks to make it a little more accessible and you're not doing lots of repeated requests against S3. Yeah. Uh, 
but that's done during processing. Uh, you mentioned at one point that you were making a financial decision, uh, I believe, about the processing based upon the data the, that you were working on. Uh, you don't have to go into details, but sure. could you talk a little bit more about uh, that process that perhaps you guys are using? Uh, the process uh, to make the financial decision, or, yeah, okay. What, what, are, you, what are you choosing as you're doing that? Right? Yeah. I, I believe that's what you were saying. Yeah, so it's, um, it really comes down to kind of how much do you parallelize it, how big is the cluster, um, and what are the machine sizes that are in there. Um, there's a couple of different factors that come into it. So when we talk about uh, that graph I showed, the pie chart showing where our time's going, you could use something like the Elastic Container Service and throw these into kind of big nodes, but ultimately you're moving through the network interface on that node. And so you have to really metric it to figure out where, where's the actual bottleneck? Like, would throwing more nodes at this go up, speed things up, or would size make a difference? Ultimately, kind of what the driver for us is how long can we have people wait for data? Um, and so if it's, you know, we, we had some discussions around, you know, once we cross five minutes to create the bucket, five minutes versus four minutes, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. Um, now, if we're talking five minutes to come back tomorrow, it's a different discussion. And obviously that also depends on how much data is being requested. So kind of the knobs we have to turn is uh, when we spin down to a, um, uh, some of the guys here who worked on this can tell me, Andrew, I think it's $5 an hour for our smaller cluster, is that right? That's our bigger cluster, is about $5 an hour to keep that cluster. That's about 20 nodes. Uh, it's about $5 an hour to keep those hot. Um, but uh, again, if it's network, throttled, having bigger instances isn't gonna do any difference for us, it's not gonna help us. Um, and then if it's actually data fetch, well, we could actually go at that by caching some of this on like EBS or something like Elastic Block Storage and putting some data local to that node, which basically makes that 30% time just disappear and fall off. Um, so then we have to do the cost trade of, okay, do we locally cache this data versus how much does that speed up the delivery? So it really, I mean, it, bottom line to your question is how long are people willing to wait for their data and then trade that against costs and then look at from the cost model, local caching, network transfers, processing time, and then kind of auto-scaling group time. If it's under heavy load, we can let it auto-scale up and then just spin back down, but it's too slow to do that for spike load. Were you able to come up with a heuristics um, to, to find the forcing function to when to horizontally scale? Uh, it, it, a generic function. No. No, that's, that's, <laughs> um, the, that's the one we're trying to solve. Yeah, okay. no, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, Andrew, I'll put you on the spot if you have anything you wanted to, if there's any kind of heuristic that you would implement here, but. Thanks. I got the microphone to give a long answer that is no. Um, <laughs> We didn't optimize this uh, to a level where we're comfortable with our scaling policy. So our scaling is really just our partition size to nodes, and we're saying the smaller the partitions per process, the happier we are. But there are some very obvious problems with that, the bottlenecks being one of those. And you can get larger instances that do have better network interfaces, but the value at that point you have to consider because they're a bit more expensive than the smaller, slower, but cheaper ones. That's a really unsatisfying answer, I'm sorry, but that's where we are, yeah. I'm sorry? These are C5s, right? So the video building side, those. <laughs> Thank you. So for the video building side, size, those are C5, uh, they just came out in May, the C5D uh, class, 4X larges. Uh, for the czar generation, because it's really not that uh, compute intensive, it's really just deep copies and some small transformations from the NetCDF into the czars. Those we just used M5 larges and we scaled up to a cluster of 60, 80. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, have you, it's an in-house chunker. 
Uh, no, for the the czar supports kind of data chunking based on chunk sizes, and then that kind of also affects S3 writes. Uh, so the question is, how do we do the data chunking within the archive? Um, in this, so key partitioning is different. Key partitioning is in house. We kind of figure out how we want to parallelize this. The actual write into the data is configurable when you create the czar archive. You set chunk sizes, and then um, I don't think I can actually. If I could pull one up, I'll. If, I can, I'm happy to show you one. It's real obvious kind of what's happening is it's creating basically this tree group underneath. When you use an S3, so Zar supports pluggable backends, um, and one of them is S3. There's also Google file system. Uh, you can also do zip as your backend. Um, for the S3 one, uh, it has inherent support for key value mappings, and so it would, based on that chunk size, it will then create a hierarchy of keys. Uh, and then blow it out across that. The problem is you can't change the chunk size once you've created the archive or once you've, start, once you've opened the archive. And so you really need to tune that knowing what you're about to put into it. And there's tons of optimizations can be done in there too based on the reading patterns, not just the writing patterns. You could optimize for writing, but then depending on what you're doing with read, you may actually want a slightly different chunk size. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, really interesting, Dan. Um, just a question. So, if I understand correctly, um, if I run this currently, this is on your bill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you I understand correctly. Yeah. That's. <laughs> I, I presume um, eventually you'd want this to be, um, you know, paid by the customer. So, as a future user of some service, have you done any testing with being able to approximate like the the cost overall cost of a job depending on what the tuning is, and some way to convey that to users? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, we know where we are now. Uh, no, it's not something I'd want to convey because I, I don't think we've got it right yet. Um, there's lots of tuning and kind of cost optimizations. Right now, um, we, kind of what we have is this cluster available to do this processing, but it's not necessarily, it's not optimal for kind of, it, it depends on your load, it depends on the size of the data, it depends on how, um, what the sustain load versus spike load looks like, things along those lines. Um, right now, um, this is something that we're tuning, and so I don't feel comfortable that the costs we're seeing right now are representative of where we want to be. Okay, but I guess in general, like, um, if I were a future user of the service, I would want to know, say, if I press this button. Absolutely, um, <laughs> yes, yes. You know, set some yeah. limits. Okay. No question. Um, some other options there, so like there's compute time that we're paying for, but right now we're also paying for storage costs. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't also give us a bucket or we could create a bucket, you know, delegated uh, roles or something to that effect where we could actually generate directly into your space. Um, and then there's a compute cost, but there's no kind of ongoing data hosting cost or anything like that that would that'd be part of it as well. That's another model. Um, yeah, so I, I, it really depends on data, right? So the data size, once the output archive, it depends on the length of the clip you've taken. Um, that's just rack rate S3 storage. Uh, that's just depends on the size of the data in there, which is, you know, pennies on the gigs. Um, the compute size uh, at our 20 node cluster, it's like $5 an hour. Um, 5 hours an hour 60 node cluster. Uh, yeah. So for that example, so for like Maria, no, oh, no, no, it's nowhere near that. No, from, um, uh, so, you know, $5 for our 60 node cluster, $5 an hour, that's $60 for 12 hours. That, that Maria segment, which is a couple days worth of data, maybe it's a couple weeks, I think it's like two weeks worth of data, it's like September to October. Um, that puts it in the order of, uh, I, I think it's, it's a couple hours, right, to kind of stage that data. Yeah, so tens of dollars. Yeah. Hey, Dan, I had a quick question. Uh, all the way in the back. Oh, got you. Uh, so this is awesome, and I think you caveated it that uh, you know it's a prototype and a demo, all that. A lot. Um, yeah. But it's obviously a, a working system in some context, and it works <laughs> on stage. Yeah. Uh, so it, would you be willing to share sort of a rough estimate of time that it's taken for you to get this far? Yeah, uh, sure. So um, it depends on pieces of it. Uh, some of it obviously is kind of bringing the, the knowledge of, of getting at that data. Um, I couldn't tell you that. Uh, this kind of came out of some work that uh, Andrew had started around Himawari data, um, and then we applied it to Go's targeting the audience for here. Um, the front end, I mean, we're talking, 
I don't know, maybe a month to kind of put together, give it a little, little three weeks uh, to kind of give the GUI here that you needed for this. Um, stringing together the kind of the, the services and the processing, a lot of that is kind of, uh, it's one of those once you've done it for other systems. So when we built things like this for, you know, processing NASA data or whatever the case may be, it's, it's pretty directly applicable to repeat that. So, but it's not years worth of work by any stretch. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much thank for that you. information, and uh, thank you for uh, working hard to make this data usable and accessible so we can better understand their. So we're gonna take a short break. I ask everybody to come back at, um, uh, at five of, and uh, our next session is gonna be machine learning with Earth observation imagery. Thank you all. Oh, and don't forget to um, rate the session on your app. <laughs>